Would you please pray with me? Lord, we are on the advent of something. We find ourselves waiting with bated breath and anticipation. We find ourselves waiting with fear and anxiety and trepidation. We are on the advent of something. But God, may we also hold on to you, our rock, in the midst of the unknown and feel your love pouring out to and through us. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be glorified in your sight. For you, O oh God, are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. This first Sunday of Advent is the Sunday where we light the hope candle. It is a Sunday of hope as the physical nights lengthen and we long to see, we light this first candle, hope. That powerful force in the world that keeps us going, that this is not the end. It is hope that allows us to dream and to imagine, to think of the potential and the possibility that exists in the world, unfurling around us like some magic carpet, transporting us from where we are to where we could be. Hope. Hope is that thing that's often belittled. It's childlike, naive, foolish. Hope exists, though, also in the big and the bold and the audacious. And hope exists in the quiet faithfulness of our days in and out. As I wrote this, I couldn't help but wonder, is there anything other than hope that is allowed for the movement of humanity? And for us as Christians, we're left wondering, what does it look like to hope faithfully? For hope is a powerful thing wielded. It can be wielded in ways that lead to chaos and division, or it can be wielded in ways that bring comfort, encouragement, and love. We rarely, <laughs> okay, I've never actually heard of anyone pointing to the wise men on the first Sunday of Advent. I know, I know, they come much later in the story when we celebrate Epiphany with the star guiding and the gifts being given to the Christ child. But I wonder if the wise men are a perfect bookend for us this Advent season. See, the wise men traveling long and far from home could not travel back by the road that they had taken before. They could not travel on the road that was known, the road that was familiar, those steps that they had taken just a few weeks or months before. Instead, the scripture tells us that they traveled home by another route. So too, this Advent, we are traveling home by a different path. The rhythms and the routines of this Advent season have been ruptured They've been broken open, and we feel exposed in the winter solstice of the soul. We're not familiar with this road. The beats that have become a comfort to us, time-honored traditions that tether our, us to ourselves and to our loved ones are no longer possible. And we're left wondering, what do we do and where do we go from here? I have memories from when I was little of my dad and I rising early. The gurgling sound of his percolator coffee pot chugging me awake. Eyes opening to the slightly tangy smell of sourdough biscuits baking in the oven. We would sit, the house still quiet, as hot air was blown into billowing silks. Snoopy and Charlie Brown and Garfield. I was mesmerized as the bands played and the dancers twirled and batons and flags whirled in the air with the color guards. 
and the floating by of famous actors and musicians of the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. There was such wonder and awe. There was such excitement. It all seemed to take flight in my childish imagination. And year after year, there was such rhythmic predictability. My mom and brother opting for a few extra hours of rest, finding my dad and I sitting transfixed. For me, this is a memory of home. Now I'm going to invite you to do something maybe a little bit strange. But you know me, I love something good and something a little bit strange. So I want you to sit and I want you to make yourself comfortable. And if you feel safe, I want you to close your eyes or if clothing, closing them is not an option, maybe let them go out of focus. And I want you to feel your heart beating. And I want you to feel your breath, air coming in and air going out. And I want you to think about home, whatever that means to you. With your eyes closed, I want you to think about what home feels like. The warmth, the comfort, the relaxation, the ability just to be. That is home. With your eyes still closed, I want you to think about the smells. Freshly brewed coffee, mom's perfume, the smell of fresh laundry or last night's slightly burnt dinner. That too is home. I want you to think about the sounds Dogs barking happily, children babbling, the familiar white noise of our lives, the dishwasher, the creak of that one floorboard in the hall, music being played. That is home. I want you to think about what you would see, having it play across your mind's eye. The gentle peacefulness of a candle lit and a book laid out. The image out of favorite window. Maybe you see smiling faces. This is home. What and when is home for you? You can open your eyes if you want to. Is home when you were young? Is home when you yourself were a child or when the kids still lived in the house? Is home that one place back then, or is home something you long for in the future? If so, you are not alone. I know I've used this quote before, but it's one of my favorites. Science fiction author Kurt Vonnegut writes this of home. He writes, home is where, where is home? He says, I've wondered where home is, and I realized it's not Mars or someplace like that. It's Indianapolis when I was nine years old. I had a brother and a sister, a cat and a dog, and a mother and a father and uncles and aunts, and there's no way I can get there again. We can't go back to that time and place. Like the Magi, we have to find home by a different road. And maybe in its physical reality, we can't go home at all. Not even Kurt Vonnegut could create a time traveling machine to transport himself back to be that little boy in Indianapolis with his brother and sister, with his dog and his cat. But maybe this advent, we're to head home, not to some place, but as James Baldwin writes, perhaps we're to head home to home some irre irrevocable condition. And this Advent, we're called to prepare hearts that are home for the coming of Christ. My sophomore year in college, I spent a study abroad semester in England. Honestly, the study part is probably misleading. It was a semester abroad where we took classes three days a week and were encouraged to travel the remaining days. And boy, did we travel. 
That semester seemed like one from a fairy book as I roamed cathedrals and castles, as I was taken in by the awe and the wonder of it all, of places with such rich, deep history. This semester abroad happened before international cell phone plans were accessible, and so I remember with my calling card going down to the basement of my school and nestling myself in a wooden phone booth there, calling home every Sunday night to assure my parents of my safety. Nestled in that booth, I remember hearing plans of my parents' next big adventure, moving from our home in Wyoming to Petersburg, Virginia, to be closer to my grandmother, my granny, who was in need of more care at the time. Weekly, as I told my parents of the wonders I'd seen, they would tell me stories of boxes packed and things discovered. And when I would return at the end of the semester, I would not be going to the little parsonage on McKinley Ave in Rock Springs, Wyoming. I would be going to my parents' new home. Getting home that semester was a series of unfortunate events. Flights missed, me crying in Heathrow Airport, a man dressed as Santa Claus and a woman dressed as an elf attempting to comfort me as I hysterically sobbed about being on standby for the foreseeable future, just wanting so much to be in the comfort of home and lost in the chaos of holiday travel. But finally, on Christmas Eve, I got off the plane at the Charlotte airport, my mom greeting me at the bottom of the stairs, and we welcomed Christ coming into the world at a Waffle House before driving to our new home. I wonder this Advent season, amidst the grief of the not ideal and the making the best of a bad situation, what are the ways that we can make home within the waffle houses of our hearts? As Robert Frost said, home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. And the homes we make hold all of ourselves. They hold our joy and our grief nestled and living alongside one another. But as author and speaker Nora McInerney reminds us, our need for joy and celebration cannot erase or replace our sorrow. And our expression of gratitude or happiness doesn't need to be confined to specific days. Our grief and our gratitude are not in competition with one another. They do not cancel each other out. These things exist simultaneously in the hearts of our home. When asking folks what made home, the answers that were shared with me were much like Frost's. Home is a place where you can bring your whole self, not the pretty, perfect, performative self that you sometimes show the world. But home is a place where our grief and our gratitude aren't in competition with one another. Traveling home by a different road is scary. There is real loss in the safe, the comfortable, the familiar. But there is also a chance to meet God and to meet ourselves anew as we walk this road. We cannot merely put on cruise control. In this, Paul has something to teach us now, giving us direction and guidance so that we may find our way home. Within this passage, we learn several things. First, Paul teaches us of the importance of giving thanks, even in the unideal. See, in this passage, Paul is writing to a community that is experiencing extreme division and conflict. And it would be so easy to start his letter from a place of chastisement or frustration or even anger. I can imagine Paul wondering, what do I have to do? How many times do I have to say it for the Corinthians to understand These foolish people keep missing the point. But instead of beginning from a place of judgment and condemnation, instead, Paul begins from a place of thanksgiving, 
gratitude that maybe can live alongside grief. Then, Paul goes on to talk about how God's presence enriches us, gives us comfort and assurance, especially during trying times. It strengthens us and gives us gifts for times such as this. And lastly, Paul reminds the Corinthians that God is faithful. God is with us in the hard and messy moments when we feel lost, as well as God is, is, is in the beautiful and the idyllic. God, Emmanuel, is with us. These truths are the stars that guide us home. Several days after our daughter Eliza was born, we loaded her into a baby carrier, gently putting her impossibly small body into what felt like a gargantuan car seat. I sat in the back with her as my husband Dan drove, using my hand to make sure that her head was supported from any bumps or potholes along our way. As we made our way to her first doctor's appointment, and as the pediatrician examined Eliza, she asked us if we ever remembered life before her. Oh, yes my husband Dan and I said dreamily. We could remember the mornings of sleepy, sleeping in, the lazy Saturday walks to the farmer's market, the late nights with a glass of wine, dreaming big dreams with our friends late into the night. Honestly though, as Eliza grows, it's harder and harder to remember those days. They've been replaced with giggles and laughter and with lots of snuggles. Of course, there are sleepless nights and poop explosions and a deafening murder cry that happens unexpectedly and only ends when Eliza falls immediately asleep. <laughs> Our physical home has been forever changed by this little 16 pound presence. Our heart homes too will never be the same. As we prepare this Advent for the coming of the Christ child, we might only remember life before and dream of the life to come after this hard season. But I also wonder if in this moment, we are being invited to travel home by a different path. And on this Sunday of hope, I hope on this unfamiliar path, that we may learn something about ourselves and learn something about God. May it be so for you and for me. Amen.